are you considering a prioritization of uh, of out of kind mitigation? In other words, you know, if if you're impacting a biological resource, that it would be replaced with an out of kind biological resource, or you know, and what you just described of of you know something being more uh conceptually you know connected um you know is there kind of a a range of of options that are prioritized so that uh, i think so, so go, go ahead rich good ahead. well i was just going to say so that actually is part of the framework discussion so okay. we we probably haven't gotten there yet but um that is one of the things that we need to understand in terms of putting together a framework about how we make these decisions about um, what the out of kind mitigation requirement would be. So, um, you know, as Sean said, so far we've not even set boundaries, but um, by the nature of our project, it's coastal. But we, coastal can be, you know, terrestrial, it can be marine. And so, we haven't even made a decision that marine impacts have to be mitigated in a marine environment. They could be in terrestrial environments, but that could be something that we would say that that's not acceptable. You know, so we definitely can set and and presumably we'll have a series of like recommendations or, you know, it could be a flow chart or something like that that will sort of guide decisions and then we'll set those kinds of priorities. But we that is we're going to start that discussion today, but it's definitely a big part of what we'll end up with, but we haven't made the decisions yet. Great. Thank you. I that think we helps me get yeah, I think we didn't want to over constrain. Reference. We didn't want to over constrain people when they're just sort of kicking, you know, brainstorming, kind of kicking out ideas. But this moving to the framework discussion is is going to start to do that exactly, begin to put the boundaries on more specifically and, and figure that out. Uh, Pete, you had a, a question. I just wanted to follow up really quickly because I had a similar thought, but I was I wanted to know whether it would be expanded to the idea that you could just simply monetize the the, the uh, injury. And so if there was a good way to monetize the injury based upon ecological service, whatever it is, and um, right. would that be, I mean, that's clearly a, out of kind, it could be put back in kind, depending upon what you do with it. Would but could an end state be dollars? As of right now, I guess uh, potentially as of right now, yes, yes. So we we've not constrained it, but that's definitely something we should talk about and what what's what's acceptable and and all that kind ah. of stuff. So yeah, totally. It seems like that would um, violate some of the fundamental philosophies underneath you know under pinning different policies federal and state mitigation policies right now um and it that sort of thing is what got mitigation such a bad name back when it first started being developed in 70s and 80s maybe um but i would say yeah we shouldn't take it off the table and i meant more in a framework of you can i think it's it's harder to be honest with you to translate losses of let's say reef fish to estuarine habitat or maybe let's uh, let, but let's say coastal sage habitat or something right yeah. um than it is to monetize that loss of you know reef fishes and then say how much coastal sage habitat would that buy you know or would that right. create and so it's it it avoids that really, I think, problematic translation of one system to another. It just goes through almost an appraisal approach, which is you figure out how much it's, it would cost to rebuild the lost resources, and then you have that as your dollar figure, and then you use it however politics is pushing you in that particular year. And in a way, that's sort of like a natural resource damage assessment yep. um, in the sense that you are figuring out what the injuries are and then you are and you get some amount of money for that and then you are making decisions about the best ways to spend that money on 
related resources, but it's not necessarily a one-to-one. -one. So, I, I mean, that's a, I think that's a creative way to think about it. And definitely it's not what I had thought of before, but I think that's on the, on the table. Thanks. So, so Pete, um, this is Eric. Uh, when I give the update on the eco, I'm on the ecosystem services group. So I may touch on this a little bit because right, this is a big debate yeah. I would say on the ecosystem services side is this monetization question. So we'll maybe put that on the parking lot for now. So. And, and so why don't we, why don't we kick over that uh, uh, now, but let me just say one, one quick thing. Um, so uh, we do want to be cognizant of the existing, you know, legal and policy for, um, uh, context of these discussions, but not completely constrained by it, right? So we're trying to build some, we don't want to do this completely out of context such that, such that our guidance is not applicable or too hard to apply to our, um, our, our agency manager uh, partners, friends. Um, but we shouldn't be overly circumscribed by that. Similarly, um, some areas and the most glaring example is probably, uh, you know, coastal wetlands. Um, you know, we want to draw upon what knowledge we have of these systems, and that's totally cool to draw up examples and, and, and references and all that kind of good stuff from, say, coastal salt marsh. Um, indeed, most of the references will probably be associated with, with that uh, uh, ecosystem. Um, but uh, again, this is for the entirety of the coast. So as, as Rich and, and, and Pete were mentioning, right, this is the land next to the sea, the sea next to the land. And so, so um, want to be cognizant of the policy, want to be cognizant of the ecosystems that we're most familiar with and the communities we're most familiar with, but, but do remember that we're, we are um, trying to apply this more generically. And if the policy is too constrained or whatever, you know, we, we do want to make sure that we're not um, overly circumscribing our ideas or our concepts as we go forward. Just wanted to make that note. Okay, great. Um, so why don't we start with, uh, since Eric is on my screen, why don't we start with uh, Eric's subgroup uh, to give us a, a, and again, you guys are just going to give us a brief less than five minute, how things are going, that kind of stuff. Um, and, uh, and uh, you know, tell tell us what you found. But then also, uh, as a wrap up, uh, one cool thing that uh, that that surprised you all, or that that you were interested to discover in the last month, month and a half. Eric. Uh, yeah, and I don't know if there's anybody else from my group on the call or not. So um, I'll just jump I, in. I, I'm here, Eric. Oh, yeah, here. yeah, I can't do those. Super. So Becky, you keep me honest here. If there's anything that I forget. Um, <laughs> so. Um, so we, yeah, we had a check-in call last week and I would say probably um, like a lot of the groups where our progress has been a little bit slower than expected. I think that's largely because the student group that we're working with, um, you know, working on ecosystem services, it's, it's kind of a new area for a lot of people. So there's a lot of spin up time. Um, and so what we've decided to do is um, we've decided to kind of uh, break the task down a little bit and we're going to, start with just a small, rather than trying to take on ecosystem services overall, we're going to start with a, a small number of services to, that the students can start uh, focusing on. And we've tried to divide those a little bit between sort of the traditional sort of regulating, provisioning, supporting types of uh, cultural, the four, you know, categories we normally bin services in under the um, ecosystem services, millennium, millennium ecosystem services framework. So we identified three uh, services to start with, erosion protection, fishery support slash food production, which kind of covers two different categories, and then recreation slash physical and mental health. And so that gives us sort of a, um, a cross section across the different categories of ecosystem services. And then for each service, we've sort of tasked the students to think, to sort of come up with almost like a bulleted outline of you know, why is that service important from a compensatory mitigation perspective? Who are the main beneficiaries that potentially benefit from each of these services? Um, what are the options for how to evaluate the service? And so going to Pete's comment, I think we want to think about both monetary and non-monetary um, approaches because monetizing these services can be convenient and problematic at the same time. Um, and then what are some of the challenges or potential conflicts um, that may occur um, if you're trying to think about balancing um, from a services perspective versus a functions perspective? And we sort of put out this question is, are those 
compatible goals? Like, can you can you maximize services and functions, or do they work at odds against each other potentially? So that's sort of um, so we, we've at, what we've decided to do is start with the three those three services and try to kind of quickly try to put, go through those four kind of topics, and then you know kind of see where we are, um, see how everybody's doing, and then decide you know, whether we need to sort of scale up to a broader set of services or not, maybe, maybe that's sufficient to give us kind of enough to work with in terms of um, how to feed back into the framework. So that's kind of our strategy moving forward. And we're going to try to get some progress. I think we had targeted with Vanessa, maybe by like the end of the month to try to at least get a first cut at some, some of the basics of that. So that's kind of where we are. Um, unexpected. So that's a, that's a good question. What's unexpected? I, I have to say, I've been thinking a lot about this because I'm on work groups with multiple agencies right now working on this issue. So um, I've been thinking a lot about services, but I think maybe not unexpected, but one of the, I think, conundrums that I've um, been sort of noodling on, like a lot of people, is this issue. Coastal California, right? When you think about services, um, you know, and the sort of population that typically lives along the coast, one of the big things we've sort of been struggling with is how do you account for services that coastal wetlands might be providing to communities that don't live along the coast, right? And then how, what can you do? Like, is there a trade-off, like Rich was saying, are there things that you can do, like, for example, improving transportation that would allow inland communities to get more benefit from coastal resources that may be totally far afield from anything resembling, um, you know, you know, restoration, but could have the potential to allow inland communities that currently don't benefit from coastal resources to have more access to those resources. So it's not so much a surprise, but sort of just kind of an interesting um, issue to sort of ponder over. So I don't know, Becky, if you have other surprises or things you wanted to add from our earlier conversations. No, I don't think so. No, no surprises. I mean, you know, what Eric just said, we're we're dealing with all the time now with marine protected areas and and needing to try to figure out those ecosystem services uptick for people doing just that, you know, even getting to the marine protected areas to benefit from them in, in some way, shape, or form. So no, you you did a great job and um and I think our team works very well together, which is great. <laughs> Sean, you're muted. Sean, any questions or feedback? Sorry, so, so, no, 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 that's great. Sorry, I, I was, I was gabbing away. No, that's great. I think, uh, yes, I think, I think uh, the 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 conundrum that that Eric was talking about, we we think about a lot as well. Um, and our demographic data is is helping us think through that. Um, awesome, great, uh, Christine. Sure. So the structure group, um, well me and the um viviana and um let's see when did we meet we met a couple times we met um i think early in july just to figure out how we were going to get started and um nick and viviana took on two of the major tasks and then we've recently added johanna to helping out though we haven't had a chance to meet and the first thing we sort of tackled was when we put together the documents, thinking about what was a structural component. You know, we had a pretty good definition of what we felt meant a structural component. We had an idea of a lot of the um, components that would be there. But as a group, we had identified three or four terms that we felt were thrown around, I guess would be the idea without concise definitions and certainly not an idea how they might apply to mitigation. So as a group, we started to tackle those. So those were thinking a little bit about complexity and biodiversity as terms. They seem really simple, but they're applied very differently across different management questions, as well as across different ecosystems and potential mitigation projects. So Viviana um, and Nick both took on doing literature review of those. Um, like you heard from Eric, you know, we met about it again and we agreed that, you know, the ramp up time to understanding, you know, what we needed in a literature review was pretty steep. So um, 
these guys sort of spent uh, the rest of the time putting together documents. So we have a document in our folder where we both have the notes from all those literature reviews and then key questions as to how they apply to mitigation in different ecosystems. And then all those are saved in sort of our literature folder. We haven't crosswalked them to the Zenodo yet. But I think what that did was, um, you know, get us a good start as to how we want to conduct the literature review. We also sat down and um, talked about addressing the, well, hopefully when we meet with Johanna, she we'd ask her to take on the third one, which was a little bit of, a little more complex, but maybe thinking about what do we mean by habitat composition, both on a regional scale, we had talked about potentially a mitigation goal with, that might affect decision making was, well, is that the only one of those habitats in the region? So that it will be our third big literature review topic. And then what we did in our last meeting, and maybe this is where our surprising comes in, is one of the products we'd like to have um, is sort of this uh, crosswalk between the structure group and Eric's function group is structured a function tables for each habitat. And then, you know, what elements do we need to research further in there? So biodiversity and complexity would be part of them. And maybe our surprise was, or maybe this reveals our complete bias as ecologists, is when we put together the table, we decided that all ecosystems, all ecosystems we talked about had almost all functions. So it wasn't a particularly <laughs> useful exercise, um, but we have a very green table um, and that will be sort of our next challenge is to tease that apart, right? Um, at its current iteration, it's it's not very informative, but I think that gets to the crux of the issue. How do we tease out which of those functions is more offered by a habitat and does it really just scale with condition relative to the absolute habitat? So, and I know cool. I saw Viviana was on here um, at, from our group that had met. I don't know if you have anything you want to add, anyone from who wasn't there or Viviana who was there. So, um, no, not really. Basically, um, the introduction you gave is perfectly described of what we talked about in our meetings. Personally, for me, and I think all the other undergrad assistants, that it's a little bit difficult to you know, look up these references and try to have a you know um, a brief introduction about it before just heading into like and finding mm -hmm. it about a paper because each paper is like like um uh, like she said that it's it's different in each paper so it's kind of like what is the true definition of which but it's pretty interesting to read all these different papers from different authors so it's broaden uh, my knowledge of what coastal mitigation is all about so thank you cool. good. Awesome, great, yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, absolutely, we, we, we are, I am learning, we're learning how to also help onboard everybody. And so this was our first, first effort. So <clears throat> um, yeah, definitely, uh, I think for our ne next phases, we'll, we'll spend more time before we even get together as a group with our, with our undergrads and, and get them up to speed, but, but great. Uh, that sounds cool. Um, Spencer. Spencer, so it looks to me like you're unmuted, but I can't hear you. I, can, well, I yeah, can't yeah. hear you either, Spencer. Nope. You I can't hear you. Take a stab again. I'll just say while well, Spencer's doing that, um, our uh, graduate uh, student that was helping Spencer's group out had to step out. So I'm starting this week, I'm stepping in to help uh, help uh, Spencer's group too. Um, is he able, is Spencer able to talk? Or anybody else from Spencer's group want to, want to, that might be here, want to, want to, ch can you chime in and just give us a quick uh, couple sentence overview about what you guys have been working on? So he's back. Let's see if we can talk. Technology so exciting. <laughs> Good sign connecting to audio. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Oh, so it's it's yeah. <laughs> hallelujah. That's good. Yeah. 
Yeah, I don't know why I have problems with Zoom, but um, so um, our subgroups is subgroup is one of the ones that um, took some early hits. Uh, we lost uh, Josh Collins early on. I think Max Gomez has been our most consistent performer um, and attendee. Um, and we've Michelle Matson now has joined our group, thankfully, and it looks like Sean's going to be helping us as well. Uh, Pete's been um, participating a bit, and um, I've been involved. Um, what we our focus has been, uh, we we had Samantha as our research associate, but she needed to, to step away. Um, but what our focus was um, was on this currency that we were talking about. Um, what is it that these systems are doing and just to establish some sort of a baseline or a framework for these different habitats that we're looking at and then what we choose to do with those i think that's where ecosystem services and things like landscape and um some of these other factors that we're considering that's that's where we can decide what we should do um, but what we're trying to get at is like what's actually happening whether we're looking at a riverine system or a a salt marsh or open water or beach. Um, try to figure out like what is it that each one is doing, and we can um, we can do that kind of comparison to figure out well if we're looking at functions, for example, um, or some sort of integrity index, some sort of health index, like a California Rapid Assessment Method condition assessment what's happening at one at the impact site versus what could happen at a mitigation site. And at least you've got that baseline to, to think about. And so we did, we've got the benefit of having a couple of methods available. One is that California rapid assessment method. Another one is the hydrogeomorphic approach to wetland and waters assessment. And so if you look at our write-up, um, it's basically me <laughs> adding that stuff because I have familiarity with those methods. And so I've identified some metrics and submetrics and we call them variables in HGM. And I've written up some of those types of metrics that we can think about. And we can decide whether we wanna focus on particular metrics or submetrics in doing this early evaluation um, of these habitats, or we can look at them. Um, one thing that we might wanna think about is Did we lose him? Oh, you you froze for a second, or are you uh, your audio froze, Spencer? If uh, go back about thirty seconds. Uh, oh, now, now you're dead, dead. <laughs> <laughs> we can see you moving, but we can't hear you. Yeah, There's a song in there somewhere. No, that's good. It's, it, well, we, I, th I think that, that's okay. Don't, don't stress. I, th I think we got the main points. That's cool. I mean, we just ask one quick thing. It was, what was the surprising thing? Or, or you could put it in chat or, or something if, if there was one idea that was. Uh... Well, well, actually, let me, let me just sort of back on that. Back to the beginning of the we can't quite hear you, but you said something about Max. Max, is there something something surprising that you uh, that you discovered over the last uh, six weeks or so? Uh, kind of like what Viviana said, we did so much like different things. So getting to know a whole bunch of like different topics is really exciting. Uh, one thing that I found is that going through the I believe it's HDM HDM uh, functionally talked about nectar utilization, and one article I read was like uh, research is able to determine how often or where uh, specific fish species uh, spend most of their life based off of like the the metals in their eardrums. Uh -huh, yeah, so I thought cool. that was really interesting. <laughs> yeah. yeah, source tracking using yeah. <laughs> uh, science and, and uh, otoliths and all the excitement. Yeah, that, very cool, very cool stuff. The color of it. Awesome. Well, great. Well, thanks everybody. Sorry yeah. for the, the, the audio hiccups, but I think that's great. We got a sense of where people are going and that's cool. And again, you know, we're, we're trying to figure this out as we go. And so the fact that things are taking longer than we thought is not, you know, it's not the end of the world. It's all good. We, we want to produce a quality product. So, so, um, we're all good there. Uh, we're all good. Let me just, uh, just try.
do this. Can I? Um, okay. So somebody, uh, let me see if I can do this. How about? Uh, I thought I could. So, so uh, somebody's making some noise. I don't know why I can't. Uh, I don't know why I can't mute some folks. Um, but. Uh, Oh, okay. <laughs> so Michelle, I think you might be. I think you might be. Uh, be there right on time. I'm not okay, sure where the sound's pushy. coming from, but uh, I can. Pushy, no pressure. <laughs> really? Okay. Well, I feel. Like I, I gotta say, how about how we take a, a quick uh, three minute break? Everybody can go get some coffee and let me figure out what's going on with the audio, and we'll come back in three minutes and 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 pick up with uh, with Rich. All right, cool. Okay. okay, we'll give us, we'll give us everybody another, another minute, minute to get, get back. back. But, but I, think, think, I think we're I think good, we're good with, with uh, sound. sound. Just gonna, just gonna... Can Although, you hear me now, Sean? I have a big echo. I'm not I, I can. I just, I just muted you, Spencer. I could hear you, but there was an echo coming from me. So you can unmute and talk, but uh, but yeah, there, yeah, was, there, there, was, was, there was an echo. So you can hear me? Yes. Yes. Great. <laughs> Cool. Um, okay, let me. Make and Sean, screen. can you go back up to the framework slide? This one, one that just says. Yeah, yeah. This one. This one. Yeah, that yeah. one. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. Okay. Okay, everybody. Okay, everybody. Why don't, Why don't we? we um, um, Sean, uh, I'm hearing you. Again. Again. 
Spencer needs to mute. Yeah, so I, I just, I just, I think I just figured, I, I muted Spencer and then okay. I think it's okay. Is that, <laughs> you guys are okay now, right? If I blah, blah, blah talk? Okay, cool. So yeah, so, so I'll just mute myself. <laughs> I'll just mute myself. So if you want to talk, Spencer, I'll just, I'll just be muted so that we won't echo or whatever. All, all the, again, one would have thought going through a global pandemic and all that kind of stuff that Zoom would just be, have locked in all this, uh, excitement but apparently uh we we still have to fumble through all these great things okay awesome well thanks everybody for the great uh updates that's cool as i was saying before um uh, before we had a little bit of echo stuff uh and background noise um uh what are people are doing is great we're figuring this out as we go we're, we're obviously it's taken us you know a few more weeks or, or many more weeks than we thought to sort of get up to speed that's okay we're mostly concerned with the quality pro yes we have deadlines blah, blah, blah. you guys don't need to worry about that but 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 um but really we want a quality product and really this conceptual underpinning is really the the most important part of this project even though there are other phases this needs to be the you know it needs to be solid for us to have some informed testing and other things so um so uh again we'll we'll, we'll touch on uh schedule at the end of this session today but um uh Everybody we've checked in with the last week or so, oh, really sorry, we're really behind. Don't don't get caught up in that. We're moving forward. And so part of that moving forward is to start to move to think about our framework, which is what which again we've not explicitly discussed. And Rich is going to lead us on a little bit of a discussion thinking about some of the components um, of a framework to get our juices flowing for for the next bit of discussion here. And so with that, I'll hand it off to Rich. Right. So um I have a few things to start a discussion about framework, but um, a few caveats in the beginning. And that is that, you know, we somewhat in, on purpose in the beginning didn't try to set up a framework ahead of time because we do want to hear people's ideas and we don't want to constrain you too much. And actually, even already today, we've had a couple of questions and suggestions that don't really fit into what exactly what I'm going to be talking about right now. And so sort of the way I'm going to lead this discussion isn't the only thing and it isn't the only way to think of that. And I, I want everyone to still be thinking um, more creatively and differently too. Um, but we did want to start having some discussion about this. So next slide. And so, um, and so I started thinking about, well, so I can't control the slides, Sean. So can you go to the oh there it is, never mind. Um so I started thinking about well, what you know, what can we do? The overall goal now is to figure out we're having these discussions about the different elements and how can we put those together to come to address this ultimate question of the amount of out of kind mitigation required, the amount and type of out of kind mitigation required. So we really have a couple of options just, you know, from a basic uh, consideration. We could choose a single metric or we could use some combination of metrics. And um, so I'm going to go through kind of what some of those options would look like. But also note that we don't necessarily have to say, you know, out of kind of mitigation has to be assessed this way under all circumstances. Part of the framework could also be setting up different conditions under which we would do it different ways, or even just um, giving like uh, some sort of guidance to the way an uh, agency would make a decision without actually telling an agency, you know, how to make the decision or what to decide. Um, so we keep that in mind. Um, next slide. So for a single metric, we could just decide, okay, we're just going to um, make our decision based on a single metric. And that metric could be something that we pick a priority, ba a priority based on relevance. So for example, if an agency was really concerned about productivity, then maybe we would know before we did any sort of analysis about out of kind that we would choose something on productivity. Um, it could be like Pete had asked the question about money. 
Um, I mean, the metric could be dollars, and we could decide from the very beginning that the the object would be to come up with a with a dollar figure for what the losses were going to be. Um, another way to choose a single metric would be to assess a whole set of metrics, and then you choose the metric gives the largest amount of mitigation. Um, Michael asked uh, something about earlier about sort of what the scope was and and it's often the case that we're thinking about mitigation in terms of habitats. And so in this case, you know, it'd be relatively easy to think about what's the largest amount of mitigation because it would be the largest amount of habitat required. In other cases, it might not be even so obvious to know what was the most mitigation required because, um, because by its nature, this is apples and oranges. And so, you know, it might not even be easy to make that decision. But it, but it is one possible way we could um, think about choosing a single metric. Okay, next slide. So the other general approach is we could have a combination of metrics. And if we're going to have a combination of metrics, we could have um, a system that we decide here are the metrics that we're going to use. Um, we would need to decide what those metrics were. And that's kind of what we're going through in each of the subgroups. Because we have these general themes of structure, function, and ecosystem services, within those subgroups, we can come up with metrics. And, and Eric was talking about in the ecosystem services group, they've already sort of picked, it's not exactly metrics yet, but it's they've picked you know, three types of services that you could figure out how to measure. Um, and so it could be that we would take all of those metrics and we would come up with some formula to combine them to tell us about the amount of out of kind mitigation we would need. Or it might be we would select a subset of the metrics. And so um, there could be different ways that we could decide what that subset would look like. Um, one example would be we might pick a structure metric, we might pick a, pick a function metric, we might pick an ecosystem metric. Um, it's also possible that we would do something with structure and function, and we might decide, you know, whatever we do with structure and function is going to give us one number and then in addition we're going to do an ecosystem services one so like every assessment always has to have ecosystem services but it might be you know differences in terms of what we do for structure and function uh, next slide so i just wanted to um go over um some models i'm actually only going to talk about one model but you know this uh Many of you, we've already mentioned CRAM and HGM, and there's index of biotic integrity too. So these are kind of useful models for the way we might structure. Rich, can you just, for, for the people that don't know, can you just def, uh, tell them what CRAM and HGM stand for, just for people? The, the yeah, guys? yeah. So CRAM is California Rapid Assessment Method, and that's the one I'm going to talk about in a little more detail. Spencer mentioned the hydrogeomorphic approach to assessment. And IBI is the index of biotic integrity. Um, and so these are, you know, well-established, um, widely used methods. Uh, this, this graph shows, you know, they're on the site scale, which is the right scale for, for what we're talking about. They have different um, intensities of how much effort it takes to do the assessment and to develop the assessment method. For that matter, but um, but they're you know kind of similar, and that's why uh, we've lumped them together. Okay, so the next slide. So I'm going to just talk a little bit about CRAM, really just as a way to give an idea about how this combination of metrics could work. A bunch of people here are really familiar with CRAM, but if you're not familiar with CRAM, the, the idea with CRAM is that we're going to assess wetland condition. And that assessment is based on um, four different attributes, we say. And so the attributes are landscape context, hydrology, physical structure, and biotic structure. All, all wetlands have um, 
characteristics related to those attributes and, and the development of PRAM, those were the attributes that were determined to sort of be um, necessary for proper functioning and, and high condition and, um, and sort of across all wetland types. And so, and so the, and in some ways this is similar to our, well, we're, I mean, we don't really know what to call them. So we're calling them subgroups and themes, but, you know, we've got structure, we've got function and we've got ecosystem services. So there's some, some similarities there into the structure. Okay, so next slide. And then for each of those attributes, there are metrics that can be used to assess that attribute. And that's this table on the left. Um, and, and so overall, the goal is to get at the wetland ecological condition. We've got these four attributes. There are many, many different metrics that could be used to assess each of those attributes. But CRAM, through an extensive development process, picked these. And so each attribute has you know, two to many metrics. And some of those metrics actually have submetrics too. But the idea was these, these metrics were chosen really because they could be assessed in the context of a rapid assessment method that you would go out to the field, you do some desk work and you'd go out to the field one time and you'd be able to assess it. So there's lots of other things that maybe could have been chosen, but could not have been assessed um, in that way. And then for each metric, the table on the right, you've got, so this particular one is, buff, that particular metric is buffer width. And then you've got a way of giving it a score. And so in this particular case, it's like how much the average buffer width is. And the, the bigger the buffer width, the higher the score. And so what CRAM does then is you go through and you, you figure out, you, you um, determine the score for each metric. And then all the metrics for one attribute are combined into an attribute score. And you can look at that. And then all the attribute scores are averaged to produce an overall CRAM score. And so in CRAM, all the metrics are used in every assessment. Now, you know, there's lots of difference of details in terms of different um, wetland types and things like that. But the, the general idea is you've got this like hierarchy and, and you get a score for all the metrics and then it's all combined into one big score. Um, yeah, Pete. Sorry, I needed to unmute. Um, so it, this seems like a way that you could compare wetlands, um, you know, in terms of, I guess, some some metric of quality or something. Um, but but would it allow you to just as this is just an example? Let's say you had two wetlands and they had very different scores. They were exactly the same size. They had basically the same habitats, and you, and one was lost and the other was not. Um, would let's say they were both lost? Would there be more mitigation for the one with a higher cram score, or would it be the same? It's just that the, there were two and one was better than the other, because you have a hundred acres in both and they all have the same habitats, but one's just you know cram based better would the mitigation be the same? Um, so no, the, but I mean, it really, it depends on what the, um, the agency decides, but the general idea is that you would use CRAM to determine what the condition was, and then you would, you would have to, um, typically it would be used, like if you lost a wetland with a particular CRAM score, and then you were going to, um, mitigate that for that loss by restoring another wetland you would that had a lower cram score to start you would do a restoration that would bring it the cram score up to compensate for that loss um so i think that's i mean I and, and just the, or eric might have another way to well, let me ask one more question just uh -huh. because it would follow from that so let's say that you had one that had a cram score of x and you had another one that was X divided by two. I'm just, you know, so it's half as good, you know, by cram. Yeah. Would a mitigation 
that would, and let's say that your created wetland for the one that was lost that was X was X by two would double the acreage. I mean, can, is it as simple as doubling the acreage or, you know, modifying the acreage to make up for lower cram scores? <laughs> so Pete, I'll, I'll just jump in here and say that this is a, that question is something we have debated for years, <laughs> right? From, from, its from its inception. From its inception, right? And I think there's there's two, there's, you know, there's, and Spencer can weigh in here, I'm sure there's different schools of thought on this, obviously. So, um, but what I can say is that we, um, meaning a, we, meaning a group of agencies came together, we collect, we developed implementation. When you turn your mic on, we're getting, we're getting, getting out. echo. Um, so we've developed implementation guidelines, you know, to help answer some of these practical questions. So there's a document that was produced, like how to implement CRAM in a regulatory context. And so what that document says basically is we recommend against it because we really don't understand how well these, these condition scores scale with size, like, right. Um, what you just said, Pete, sort of assumes a somewhat linear relationship, which we're, we just don't know if that's true or not. So there, although there's some convenience to it, um, I think the, what I would say is we just don't have enough understanding to say whether that's a valid assumption or not. Okay, thanks. But it's, uh, and so I totally agree. And Cram has a big caveat about scaling and you'll see one of my last, my last slide. We'll talk about the need to be able to scale when, well, for what we're doing here. Um, but in one of your examples, you had the wetlands that were like the same size. And so that definitely makes it easier if it's the same size. So, um, um, okay, I'll mute and Spencer can talk. So can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, so when HGM was developed um, back in the 90s, it was developed for use by regulators. And when they developed it, the expectation was that similar to HEP and some of these other methods that when you calculated the score, you could multiply it by area. And so you could get at the issue that you're raising peat. Um, and theoretically, um, you could, you knew, you're, you were assuming that a lot of these relationships were linear and that you could make these mathematical um, calculations and that they were meaningful. With CRAM, it's a little trickier because some of these metrics already account for scale or the size and are influenced by size. And so um, what Eric was bringing up and, and Rich as well is that it gets a little trickier with CRAM because you can't just take a CRAM score and multiply by area and be done. You, you have to understand that you might essentially be like double counting <laughs> or you're already, you're already incorporated you know, the, the, the score that you got already incorporates area. And so if you incorporate area again, it's like, it's almost not fair. Um, but whether you're using CRAM or HGM, what you're trying to do is establish some sort of currency to compare an impact site to a potential mitigation site. What you do with it, you know, that's up for, you know, what you should do. Um, you could consider ecosystem services, um, temporal trajectory, all sorts of factors that we're also going to be considering. But it's um, at least if you're looking at the functions or the condition or some other method or some other measure of ecological integrity or health, whatever we want to call it, you're trying to establish like what is happening at these sites relative to what they're supposed to be doing. And you can then decide what you're going to do with that, but at least you've done that initial baseline assessment of what's happening at the impact site versus a, a potential mitigation site. And then I know Pete, you know, you're very familiar obviously with um, area of um, production foregone. Um, that's a, um, a very specific thing where you're looking at um, loss of organisms by entrainment and how could you potentially get that at a restored wetland. And so that's a you know very specific thing where we were doing that if there was a proposed uh, power plant um, impact on that there is an established method for for looking at that situation which gets back to what rich was saying earlier that there might be certain 
cases where it's like it's not just a matter of like are the functions replaced or not you know there's a, a very key thing in the ecosystem that you're looking at and there's an established method for addressing it. and i'll just leave it there and then the other thing i guess i should emphasize about cram is i mentioned this just as an example of how metric scores are combined to give an overall number um, but of course in cram that would be within a wetland type and with HGM even more so within a wetland type and not really it's not really set up to do like out of kind mitigation at all and so that's kind of like our challenge is to see whether there's some sort of combination of metrics that we could do that would make sense in the out of kind mitigation context as opposed to in kind so there's these these are challenging questions, even when you're talking about in-kind mitigation, and obviously it's even harder when you're doing out-of-kind. But the goal for us is to try to pick metrics that sort of are not so specific. So like in this, in the example I have up on the screen right now, you know, it's the buffer width is like really specific to this particular wetland type. And so we're trying to pick metrics that are not so specific as that. Pete's got another question. I do. It's about I mean, two questions. One is about the scoring. And the scoring, uh, I just want to know whether this, there is a score or there are four scores or there are as many scores as there are metrics. And, and I'm wondering, look, in this case, you've got 21 and you got 30, you got the, adds to 30, right? Yeah. Um, the numeric score in that particular case, Rich? Yeah. Yeah. And so would any value of 30, regardless of the composition of A, B, C, and D, be equivalent? Or do you need to get 12963 for something to be equivalent? Like if you're thinking, okay, what would be uh, compensatory for a loss of 12963? Is it anything with a 30 or does it have to be 12963? So um, the you you will, when you do cram, you will have a metric score, but, and although that there could be some insight into looking at the individual metric scores, typically we're looking at the attribute scores as, as like the main level, and they can be rolled up into an overall cram score. So, you know, it's especially useful when you're doing like some sort of kind of landscape analysis to see the distribution both of the attribute scores, but especially like the overall CRAM score. But within CRAM, it doesn't matter. So, and that and that 30 doesn't mean anything. Each wetland would be given a choice of either a score of, of three, a six, nine, or 12. So in that case, the maximum score is 12. Yeah. Um, but in CRAM, it doesn't matter what how the score, how you get. So let's say you ended up with a score of, I mean, and, and it's definitely, we're getting into more of the details, but let's just say you ended up with a score of 30 in, a, let's say 40 for, for an attribute. It doesn't matter whether you had high connectivity, low buffer, low width, and high buffer conditions to get that score, or low connectivity, high width, high you know, percent yeah. with the buffer. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. So they're not unweighted. Care. Yeah. Okay. Got it. We might care. Right. So in our situation, we, we might not want to do it this way, but, um, but for sure in cram, it does not care what the mix is. Um, cram does have, I don't know whether it's ever actually done this way. Eric would ha have to tell me, but it has the possibility of weighting the metrics if you did decide that you did care and that all those metrics were not equally important and you really thought that it was really important to have connectivity, you could weight that. Does, does, I don't know, Eric, if any if that's ever done now, but. I don't think it's really done in practice, but um, yeah, you definitely can do that or you could weight at the attribute level too as well, right? So, right. but I don't know that it's ever really done in practice. I think that, um, so what that means is that all the metrics are given equal weight, right? And so there, and that that's a weight type of weighting, and it might or might not be the right kind of weighting, but that's just sort of the way uh, we do it. And the last question I have, and then I'll get off, is uh, 
this is all vegetation, right? Geomorphology and vegetation. And so is that, does Cram just say, it doesn't matter what the fish are, the birds are, the, the inverts are, it's because if you build it, they will come. Is that kind of the feel the dreamsy hypothesis in this? Um, I think it's um, kind of, but it's more, uh, again, I think, and, uh, and Eric maybe should also say his perspective, but it's more a practical thing of that. It had to be, they had to be metrics that could be measured in a short period of time on at a site. And so there's a recognition that there are other aspects that could be really important that this misses. Um, but this was trying to get attributes that, um, or rather metrics that um, represented high quality conditions in the wetlands. And then there was a whole verification process where these CRAM scores were actually compared to more detailed measurements of, of things that are closer to functions or like the number of fish species and things like that um, to show that there was a good relationship between those more detailed measurements and this rapid assessment method. Thanks. Eric, you have? Yeah, I think that's, um... Yeah, I think that's that's exactly right. And I guess just also to um, kind of comment on Spencer's comment in the chat, right, which is that, I mean, so there are two really important points that Spencer made. One is, right, HGM, the HGM guidebooks, which are sort of more traditionally function-based, are each guidebook is sort of independently scaled against reference sites that are sort of collected you know, during the development of that guidebook, whereas CRAM, because exactly what Rich said, it was intended, one of the goals was to have something rapid that could be done re relatively quickly in the field, um, has sort of what we might refer to as an internal reference, right? That's, um, um, and, but that has been validated against, you know, sites around the state, and there are reference, there's a reference network of CRAM sites that we have collected data on over the years to to provide that, so um, so I think that's. But it exactly. was kind of the op, the opposite yeah. order of the way right. HGM went. Exactly. HGM had to establish the reference sites first. Right. Did all this measurements on the reference sites to figure out how to scale the the metric scoring and how to combine them and all that stuff. And CRAM was developed sort of from first principles. I mean, obviously based on on data and understanding, but. Yeah, uh, and then those reference sites were assessed later with CRAM. Yeah, exactly. Yep. And then two other very quick comments, and then I know we need to move on uh, to Spencer's point. HGM was really developed, I think, with a regulatory application in mind, whereas CRAM was developed with an ambient assessment application in mind. So it wasn't developed from the onset. It wasn't developed from the perspective of regulatory application. It was developed more as an ambient assessment tool. So that's sort of the reason behind some of the differences. And then the last thing I'll say, Pete, is that through, there's been a lot of uh, work to do inner team calibration with CRAM. And so the, uh, like with any of these methods at the attribute level, there's about, uh, you know, a plus or minus six, you know, uh, plus or minus six error bar on, you know, based, you know, because we've done this where you've had, you know, teams independently go and cram the same sites and we've done it, you know, teams from the Northern California come to Southern California and vice versa. So we've done all this inter-team calibration. And so we have a sense that, you know, when you see these numbers, you have to sort of understand that there's a, you know, there's an error bar just because of observer differences, right, um, in the application of the method, so. Right, um, so next slide. So as we just talked about in CRAM anyway, you have to use all the metrics to get the score. There's not really a, a choice to like drop out buffer or something like that because you don't wanna do it or whatever, you have to use all of them. But for our application, when we're thinking about, you know, something where we would have a set of metrics that would go into attributes that would go into some overall score that could be used to to determine and scale out of kind mitigation, we don't necessarily have to use all of them. So we could decide that we were going to use a subset, like I mentioned before, 
one metric from each cat attribute category or a couple metrics from each attribute category. And that could potentially be flexible, not necessarily set in stone, but flexible according to the context or the particular circumstance. And so that's just something to think and think about and remember and just to reiterate what I said before, Cram, you know, was a, established for a particular purpose for, you know, a specific habitat type for wetlands. And um, so clearly we can't just apply CRAM, but we, but CRAM gives you sort of a model for how metrics might be combined. Okay, so next slide. Okay, so we could go through more examples. I started to go through more examples. I actually was gonna go through HGM, but I decided that that's probably enough just to set the stage for our discussion right now. There's just a couple of other considerations, uh, which I already mentioned, but just to, again, to reinforce these. I mean, one is we have to be able to quantify whatever we do, it needs to be able to quantify the impacts and what we're gonna get from the mitigation project. So. Um, in that table for CRAM, you could see there was sort of like a semantic description of the condition, which gave a number. And so it can certainly be quantified that way, but there has to be some way to be able to quantify these things. And we need to be able to do it on the impacts and we need to be able to project it to the mitigation project. Um, and then the second thing is that we need to be able to scale it to determine the size of the mitigation project. And that's, that. Uh, Eric talked about the difficulty of doing that with CRAM. It's a problem with other things too, like biodiversity. So if we're gonna do, you know, if we're gonna have, um, you know, the uh, biodiversity index, you can measure biodiversity at an impact site and you could project what it would be at a mitigation site, but it's like, how are you gonna, say what the amount of out of kind mitigation should be based on these biodiversity indices. And so um, when we're thinking about the different in within our themes, the different metrics or indicators of those themes, we need to try to pick things, at least ultimately pick things that we can measure or estimate in a quantitative enough way that we can use it to scale to a mitigation project. And that's all I had, um, I think. All right, yep, that's all. So I guess we're awesome. at this point, we're looking for, you know, feedback, thoughts, um, you know, other ideas, questions. Yeah. So, so initial thoughts uh, uh, before we uh, go into the next step. People, uh, we've already had some some back and forth. That's great. But other other initial ideas or worries or suggestions. This is Pete again. Um, so it does seem to me like you know that this does allow there to be the the. Uh, calculation of the area and the quality let's say you're thinking about mitigation and you have a wetland that's been you know damaged and you are interested in trying to figure out what to do for out of kind in the end would you be able to calculate the area maybe potential location because there are limited numbers of places that these things could be done obviously and then the quality of the wetland and and if so and if so could that then be appraised? Meaning like, it, could you then say, well, this would cost this much money to build or to enhance. And if you did it, then you would have compensatory mitigation. And so then you would have a way to monetize compensatory mitigation should something be constructed or enhanced or whatever created. Um, which is the underlying principle behind APF and some HIA models too, which is APF is area production production foregone. Um, would, is that a possible, I'm not talking about the monetization now, I'm talking about would that lead to the uh, calculation of the area, maybe the habitat types and the quality of, of what would need to be produced to be compensatory, Graham? 
Um, I think it's it's hard for me to think about how that would work out, but I think that's sort of up to us to to see if we can think of how that would work out because it it's easier for me to think about how it works out with wetlands. No, I'm thinking about wetlands. I'm just thinking about pure wetland. Oh, okay. Yeah, not any other habitat. I'm thinking about if you were if you were going to lose some area, right? If that area was restored and it was a score that was equivalent and, and the same size yeah. as the area in a wetland, in a wetland habitat, that could be monetized by figuring out how much it would cost. I mean, there's a lot of wetland projects, and so you could figure out what the cost would be to do that. And that would be a reasonable estimate of the value of that loss or how much it would cost to be compensatory. That's all I'm saying. That would be the monetization approach. And then you figure out what to do with that money. Do you make a wetland? Do you use that money to buy build a reef? Do you do, you know, whatever it is. That's I'm getting back to the monetization. Uh, yeah. So I think that is, I think you could do that. I think you could use CRAM or you if there was a, Regional guidebook, you could use HGM or you could use you know, some other method to figure out what the mitigation requirement would be for in kind, um, even if there wasn't actually a place for yep. it to happen. So that would be the advantage of, of trying to monetize like that would be going through essentially a thought exercise of you know, let's make some assumptions about what the mitigation site would look like, because you'd have to make an assumption about what the cram score would be or whatever. And then how much would it cost to do appropriate in-kind mitigation? But we don't have an in-kind mitigation possibility, but then we could take that money and we could use it for something else. Yeah. And avoid yeah. the translation of value from wetland type values to let's say reef or whatever values, you just have, this is the money it would cost, use it the way you think is gonna be best. Yeah, and so all the stuff that we're talking about here are are hierarchical uh, assessments, right? So we're, 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 we're thinking of um, the this metric or this index or this whatever the, the score thing comes out at, at the end. Um, that's been uh, informed by the diversity of things that we're worried about losing, right? And so, so how we actually, so we end up with a, a score or a number or whatever, um, and then that's when we can talk about like what Pete's talking about is maybe we turn that into dollars or whatever. Um, I think I think the first step is is what should what what's the potential hierarchy of of that thing? Well, what are the potential elements we want to make sure that are at least potentially in there? Later on, we can decide whether something is so important it has to always be in there um, or under certain conditions um, that of the impact, maybe that's when something rises to the fore. But um, this first step is really... I think, Sean, let me just interject. I, the reason I keep yeah. bringing this up is I think that's not the right model. I think that the model, you should think through what the conceptual framework is because it may mm -hmm. feed back to what things are important to collect, you know, to oh, evaluate. Totally. Um, totally. And so if you start with, you know, what you're going to collect and you get to the end, then you might think, oh, no, no, actually, we actually need these things because otherwise we sure. can't translate it. Yeah, I get, yeah, it's a total fee. It's a total feedback loop and adjust and make sure and, and, and revisit. I completely agree. Completely agree. Um, but. But as a first step let's see what we're thinking about and then as yeah. we go through the construction i think we'll get to exactly what pete's t talking about and and that and that's that's more helpful to you guys right once we have a sense of of what this framework will be that will help you know finish up your sections so that we make sure we have you know we address this element or or, or we make sure we we speak to some concern or something um so great no, that's good i like that another uh, other, other initial I, thought. oh well, i had an additional thought about pete's suggestion and it's sort of a an addendum to my answer. So I think you could do this. You could go through, figure out what the impacts were to a wetland, figure out using CRAM or some other assessment method, like what a hypothetical in-kind mitigation would look like, and then figure out the cost. But it mm -hmm. seems like there might be some things that um, CRAM 
doesn't capture, but that we still might want to capture. Um, and so I'm thinking about ecosystem services in particular. So the, the CRAM doesn't deal with ecosystem services at all, but that's certainly one of the things that a loss of a wetland in a particular place will have you know very location dependent ecosystem services loss. And some hypothetical wetland somewhere else doesn't have any location specific e ecosystem services because it doesn't occur in any particular place. And then you're going to go and you're going to take that money and you're going to some some group is going to decide that money is going to go over here and what to do this and whatever that is might not have those services at all. And so it might be that you would you would do a hybrid sort of thing where you would you would make that decision about the the monetary compensation but that you might also need to pay attention to other factors that would then lead you either to increase the monetary but it might not just be just money it might have to be money that goes to particular things so that you ensure that you got right. the full range of compensation. Well, Rich, right. I, can I just interject here that I think there is a, another class of metrics that is not being discussed here. And those metrics would be stressors that are, are weighing on an ecosystem. Often those stressors are land uses or um, ambient conditions such as public use. I, it, it's interesting because as I listen here, I'm working with the Coastal Commission right now on a project, which I really can't discuss in too much detail, but we are looking for alternative mitigation opportunities and a lot of that is going back to stressors of public use of a beach and and ways to uh, restrict the use of the beach in order to relieve the stress of public use on the ecological function of the beach and so I think you know, I don't think CRAM does a very good job looking at stressors, uh, you know, specifically about stressors, but stressors is a category that does lead to other out of kind indirect mitigation that can, you know, it does have, you, you can tie it back to ecological benefits that would accrue to the system by modifying those stressors. So I think this is an area that, you know, should be given some, some thought uh, because I think it could lead to some interesting out of kind opportunity, mitigation opportunities that, that you, you know, you wouldn't get led to necessarily by CRAM or HGM. Yeah, no, I mean, and that that is like in our in our conceptualization of this. Obviously, we're 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 often thinking about a direct impact from <clears throat> the widening of the freeway or the oil spill or something like that, um, but also. And, and this might be too too high a hill to climb this first iteration, but but you know in particular dealing with things like climate change, right? Which isn't 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 a, a discrete impact or a local uh, uh, necessarily folks. It could be up across a region, right? Or or disease outbreak or something of that nature. And and um, while the the legal framework might be a little different um, in terms of choosing how to engage management, this possibly could be helpful in that context. If sea level rise is getting so high that the beaches are going away, um, how are we going to to deal with that um, that situation? Um, and I think that speaks a bit to what Michael is is talking about. Somebody says some yeah, stuff and, in the chat. I didn't see what it was. Yeah, and then Michael, I have a question for you, maybe a clarifying, this is Eric, just a clarifying question, because I, I, I think I understand the point you're making. 
So do you feel that with that approach, would it be possible to say, um, I'm going to remove a certain stressor and then relate the remediation of that stressor to a resulting functional lift in the wetland affected, right? So in other words, could you take that stress reduction action and then translate to that to what sort of functional benefit is uh, accrues from that action and then use that as a way of looking at the compensation side of things? Yeah, exactly. And, um, and you can monitor and quantify the benefit in, you know, after you have removed that stressor or modified it to determine, you know, the actual benefit um, uh, to whatever resource it is that you're, or, you know, whatever aspect of that ecological system you're, you're intending to, to benefit. So, so, so that's good. I, I'm not sure if that, I, I like, I like that, that idea, um, but I'm not sure if that's out of kind necessarily, right? So, so if we're talking about um, uh, uh, disturbance pressure on the wetland and, and the mitigation effort is to reduce the disturbance pressure on that wetland, to me, that that's, that's an, that's an in-kind type of thing, right? That, 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 that's, that's that system, that's that setting, Etc. I, I mean, I mean, I suppose the out of kind could be that using the the sandy beach sea level rise. So maybe, maybe we lose the sandy beach um, ecosystem, but we reduce the stress to the wetland or something. That 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 could be out of kind. But I, so I think it's 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 a it's a important thing to think about, a, a useful thing to think about. But I don't know if that helps us with the out of kind conundrum with the apples to oranges sort of thing that we're right. We're well, I, I think you could look at public education as a indirect uh -huh. benefit to ecological yeah. systems. Yeah. And so Sean, one thing that maybe to put in the parking lot for later discussion is goes back to this. One of the questions I think maybe was Pete who asked earlier about like, what do we mean by out of kind? Um, I think that maybe one, going back to the ecosystem services, something that is done to compensate for loss of services, some, some action may be in kind for ecosystem services, but out of kind for ecosystem function, right? And so if we think about it sort of in that multidimensional, um, you know, maybe it's not always out of kind, right? Because it could be in kind for services, but out of kind for function. Yeah, and in fact, I think that is underlying a lot of what we're thinking about in terms of function and structure too. Is that we have metrics of function and structure that we that it'll be in kind for those metrics, even though the habitat may be a different habitat type. And so I think it comes back to the fact that so often when we've talked about in kind and out of kind, it's really been thinking about impacts to habitats and restoration or creation of habitats. And so it's out of kind from that perspective, or it might be out of kind in terms of a particular species and impact of particular species and then restoration of that particular species. But, um, but we're trying to come up with some currencies that actually make it not out of kind. It's actually the same measurement that's lost and the same measurement is gained. So, and and this ecosystem services is a great I, a great example of that. Cool, cool, excellent, great, you guys, I love it. Um, uh, so I have uh, ten forty nine right now. Um, uh, my thought is to uh, toss everybody into some breakout groups. Uh, so I, I've put it in a couple times in the chat that spreadsheet. Um, maybe folks can just toss in a, a few things they're they're thinking about from there that they've been thinking about that might enter into some future potential framework or we could pull into a framework. Um, and so maybe we could take like uh, five, 10 minutes and, and whoever's in your group, you guys can jump in there or for folks that aren't, for our, our colleagues that aren't yet assigned a group, you could go ahead and join any one of these. Um, and then we could take a, a quick, uh, you know, five, 10 minute break and then and then come back and uh, 
and uh, it's all good, Becky. All good. Um, and and uh, and then we can come back and, and keep talking about this. Does that sound good? So, Sean, what do you want us to put in the spreadsheet again, just so I understand? Uh, sorry, one sec. The garbage truck is outside. While we're waiting for Sean, um, did you all have in mind uh, a particular team that you thought I would best fit? Well, I'll uh, I'll wait for him. I'll say Brian. Becky had a drop off, so there's nobody in ecosystem services except for me. <laughs> so you're welcome to join. Them. <laughs> okay. Well, I don't want you to be alone, so I guess I'll join that one. <laughs> Uh, 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 sorry. So, so um, apologies for the sound over there. Um, yeah. So, so the question was, uh, hey, so, so what do we put in there? Just, yeah. just these these things you guys have been thinking about, uh, potential ideas. So, so if it's a if it's a sort of overarching thing, or it's an individual metric or something, just so we can begin to, so Rich and Brenton and I can begin to get a sense of of what you guys are are thinking of as candidate things that would be representative of your subgroup in some type of overarching framework and not not necessarily say everything would go in there or what have you but just as a starter list of of uh what we're we're conceptualizing here um that would go into some nested thing or some some additional mm -hmm. thing is, is that clarifier is that that's still not not clear enough no, I think that, okay yeah. cool so so i got so right now according to my clock i got 1051 so why don't we come back in um at uh say 1105 that gives us about 15 minutes you guys can take five ten minutes insert stuff in there on your own in, in your your subgroups in the breakout rooms and then uh and then we can come back here at and we'll get together again and and keep chatting starting at uh uh 1105 or if people have to take off that's great that's cool sound good so we'll yeah. reconvene the breakout rooms are breakout rooms are open <clears throat> excuse me feel free to jump in whatever you've been assigned if you haven't been assigned to one uh whatever one for right now looks the most interesting go ahead and jump on in and then uh and we'll see everybody in about uh 14 minutes See, Sean Hecht is here. That's great. Oh, yeah, cool. Uh, uh, Michael, do you, do you have a, uh, let's see, let, let me let me take a look. It's like we got uh, three people in function right now, three people in um, structure. Looks like there's only two. I think. Uh, Sean would be good. Sean Heck would be good for sir, ecosystem services. Yeah, um, Sean, let, let, I'll toss you in ecosystem services. Cool. Uh, and uh, let's see, Michael, are you are you um, anything in particular? Uh, maybe maybe uh, services. Yeah, that would be fine. I, I'm still <laughs> just trying to wrap my head around oh, totally. all this, and yeah, <laughs> all good. But I, yeah, all I'll good. listen no in on it. I, 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 it. So when I've never done breakout groups, is that something that I automatically am funneled into? I just put you in there, so you should see a little pop oh, up, I and see. you can just say, "Oop, yeah," and you're good. And then we'll be back here in the main room in in uh, at eleven o five. Okay, great. Thank you. And then, sorry, who is the one? Is that Michelle? The one? I think that's Michelle. That the phone number? Yeah, I think that's Michelle. So she had, yeah, she had a, um, you know, a name also. But I think when she's talked, it's been that. But mostly, she's been doing in chat. I think. Okay, I, I, I've I've not been I haven't seen her in the chat. So. Uh, uh, Strasser's, for example. Okay, so uh, uh, Michelle, can you? Are you? Do you have an opinion? <laughs> can I put you in uh, structure, Michelle, or if you can, if you can chat? I think she's. I think she's actually in function with. Um, oh, she just joined. She just joined. She just joined yeah, with Spencer. Okay. Cool.
Okay. Now ecosystem well, services has five. It might actually only be four though. Right, 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 right. And I'm gonna pause our uh, recording here for- No, uh, bird support, something like that. So that was our goal of like what we'd produce as a product that could inform the framework was the ability for people to go back and forth across all the layers from like, what do you okay. measure on the ground to what do you put into a function table? And then can you go back and forth when you talk about different habitats? Okay, cool. Okay. That sounds good. What about quantifying the amount? How how does that fit in? Or how how would we deal with that? Yeah. I mean, right. So can you count functions? Is that what you mean well, by quantifying? Oh, yeah. Hello, we're back. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm back. <laughs> we talked about being able to count within the matrix. Like if you, like we have in our table, we have in our group, if you look at that, we have the habitat function structure matrices. And in Sorry. some ways, if you went in there, I can stick it in the chat, mm -hmm. you could count the number of functions provided and the number of functions disturbed. But to be honest, there it is, Rich. I We haven't talked about exactly how to count. Okay. So what I guess I was just thinking is like, if you look in there, you could say there were seven functions, maybe eight. I just put an example of counting that was provided by a habitat. Yeah. I don't I don't know how comfortable we are with counting, but it's something we that's uncertain in ours. We could put that in there. But it seems like just counting up number of functions doesn't really do it. You need to quantify the amount of that function that's going on because in your example of loss of building Savannah Sparrow habitat in one place. So just because, of, you know, so that would be a certain amount, you know, two acres of habitat loss or something, just because some other wetland has some structural habitat doesn't, I mean, just, it's, its existence there does not necessarily compensate for that. Yeah. Yeah, we talked about we talked about both how would you quantify and how you, how would you qualify how mm -hmm. well that provides the function and how well that habitat could provide the function versus how well is it providing the function is part of that too, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, totally, of course. So so how 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 well we make the the well, yeah. So so all those are, are key questions. Um, and we want to make sure that whatever the thing is that we're talking about, the component, the metric is actually a measurable thing, right? And then and then we can talk about how frequently we measure it or how intensively, what have you. Um, Our goal great. was determined. We feel like we can at least satisfactorily determine if we can measure it and how, but then if, if we don't, we're going to leave it as like, we don't know if this structure crosswalks to that function or not right that becomes a research yeah. need list yeah yeah right yeah and, and i said and, the, the, and and invariably there will be a a research need thing at the, at the end of this so we're not going we're, we're at the start of the process we're, we're, we clearly will have many uh open-ended questions but that's great okay but um, that's our brief summary for you guys and sorry okay, i have to drop off for another one thanks thanks so much all right cool Bye, Christine. so um Bye. So great, thanks, Christine. All right, cool. So, uh, so here we are with uh, some initial uh, ideas, um, and just sort of uh, to take a look at what um, folks have put in. Um, it looks like we have uh, so ecosystem services seems to be um, uh, talking about uh, rarity, um, uh, uh, societal value, commercial value of of things. Um, uh yeah we just I guess it, um, we just put one in we just decided to pick one service and try to work it through just as a way of helping okay. us kind of focus our thought process gotcha 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 good. okay cool cool um okay so so you guys fishery support um and and but eric presume also i mean you guys 
time limited, of course, and just had a few minutes, but, but conceptually you guys are thinking of these like four or five, uh, uh, types of sort of core ecosystem services components you're thinking or potentially like many, 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 many. Well, I think the idea and others can jump in is we, we started with fishery support as a good one because it's kind of multifaceted. And so mm -hmm. what we talked about earlier is in our group, we've identified a, a small number of services to start with just to help make the task more manageable. And so when we started to talk about fishery support, we said, well, there's different components of fishery support, right? And that's what's listed under column B. Right. There's, you know, some yep. some, you know, and you can see those there. And then we started to think about, well, what are the types of metrics you could use to measure each of those components? And then we had this sort of a discussion about monetization versus non monetization. And then mm -hmm. on the column F, we just started to put down sort of challenges that we think like issues we would have to work through to sort of operationalize this. Right. Um, and so you can read yep. those. But um, and a lot of it, like, do we you know, is sort of the monetization, like this one on column F, or, I mean, on um, line eight, row eight, is talking about, well, maybe it's just the, at the end, a qualitative scale is okay, as long as you, and some quanti some monetization can inform that. And so the outcome might not have to be dollars, but you can use monetization or other quali um, sort of um, assumption-based estimators to come up with something that's a little more qualitative as long as you can sort of follow the logic train and sort of document the, the thought process behind that. And then you can see the ones that, you know, we had issues of, again, um, are you assessing the true value of what's being impacted? Or are you really focused on the true value, like how to replace the lost service, right? So those are two different things, right? Valuing what's being, you're losing at in place versus what would it take to replace that service in a larger, to a larger beneficiary community. And then Sean talked a lot about the distributional effects and how to account for, you know, these, the potentially affected communities and that you have to do that over time. So, you know, how you deal with discounting and things like that becomes a really important issue. So we just sort of laid out some, some real potentially thorny issues that have to be going to Christine's comment, potentially research topics in the future to try to, right. to operation right. some of this stuff. Awesome. Great. Well, thanks, you guys. Appreciate that. Um, and Christine had a had a pop off, but um, it sounds like uh, her group was was focused a lot on um, uh, uh, sort of crosswalking uh, elements and and how how a particular component might be um, might relate to other things in sort of an equivalency type of a framework. Um, uh, function folks, you guys want to chat a little bit about what you were just thinking about or, 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 or why, why you thought, um, Necton was, was really, uh, a, a, an interesting one to focus on. I think, um, uh, so I would say, take a look at, um, what we have in our functions document. I, you know, I, I go through and, are, and identify a bunch of stuff with respect to metrics and submetrics, potential variables and FCIs. And that's, that's important, you know, in looking at your habitat type of interest, but I think, as we're looking at how to actually use this and approach, what I'm starting to think, um, and I think Michelle, <laughs> Michelle was, I think, commenting that she she agreed with this idea is that we need to, if we're going to be dealing with out of kind anyway, perhaps the better way of using these numbers or whatever we want to call them is, if you're looking at say like a riverine versus a salt marsh or a beach, what is the relative quality of that riverine salt marsh? or beach in its class. So like, let's say you have a crappy riverine. I'll, I'll give you this example because we dealt with this on the I-5 North Coast Corridor project. We had some really crappy riverine habitat and essentially conveyance channels along the freeway. And what we decided we were gonna do is we had the opportunity to do salt marsh restoration, like high quality salt marsh. And so that was a trade-off we were willing to make. And we actually went through even though it's not, we're not supposed to do it, they're different systems, like what would be the relative cram score? So like, I don't, I, cram is, I don't know, theoretically, I guess a hundred, but I mean, usually you're gonna, maybe like a good cram score would be 80. So like these riverine systems were like thirties, whereas like the, the salt marsh was more like 80. And so we're like, well, clearly you'd get a better healthy replacement 
um, for with salt marsh relative to the riverine. So we didn't, we weren't making a judgment call except later to say, well, salt marsh is better than riverine. We were like relative to its class, where does this riverine sit? Is it high, medium or low? Like if we want to just do it simplistically and then for salt marsh, are we getting it? So like, let's say it's in this case, it's bad riverine. Are we getting bad, medium or high salt marsh? And the answer was decidedly yes. And so comparing where that wetland sits relative to its class, I think is where we could go with this. Um, we're not initially making a judgment call that salt marsh is better than riverine or beach is better than salt marsh or anything. We're just saying, where does it sit relative to its class in, in terms of like a health index? And as long as you get the same level or better, that's what you want to be striving for. And then you can say, okay, what ecosystem services does it provide? Where does it sit in history? For example, for the I-5, a lot of those riverine wetlands and the ditches were probably historically salt marsh anyway, but because the river or the, the freeway corridor cut off um, mm -hmm. the hydrology and the, and the sediment transport and all of that, these things converted over time. So historically, it, we're going back to probably what it was anyway. And so you can start to think more broadly of, you start out with like, where does it sit in terms of a health index? And then how do you then go using it um, relative to these other factors and making what are really value judgments? And I'll just yeah. leave it there. Yeah. So I put Very a, I, I, and I think I mentioned yeah, this, John. So we, I put a link to a document in the chat where we, what Spencer was talking about, we did that, we operation, tried to operationalize that with this, Brit group in the San Francisco Bay, this Bay Area regulatory integration team, which is deals with this sort of type conversion issue a lot, right? And so this was a project that we worked on a couple of years ago with them. That does exactly what you were talking about, Spencer. You and I talked about this a lot already, right? So um, this relative assessment. That's yeah, I don't know that we've ever actually talked about it. <laughs> I just think, I, I don't know, it just, it sort of made sense to me, but um, but yeah, no, I'm glad other people have been thinking through this because it's just it's something that dawned on me. I'm like, we're we're getting all hung up on metrics and things and specific functions and like necton utilization isn't going to be all that relevant sure. to riverine <laughs> sure. or open water. Well, open water it will, but um, some things in open water like that we look at in terrestrial systems like. Um, uh, like tidal surge attenuation, you're not going to have that in open water. Um, but it is, but when you were looking at open water, that's not what you're looking at. Um, but like, how does that open water sit? Where does it sit in the class of open water? Is it in a harbor where, that has a lot of potential pollutants, et cetera? Or is it truly in the ocean? Maybe it's near, associated with a reef. So maybe that open water is better. You know, it's healthier. It does more. And then, and then you can start to get into these trade-offs that we're talking about. So yeah. it's easier to think about how you could do that when you're talking about cram and different wetland types, but you would need to have a measure of the health of that system or whatever, a health index for each type. And they would have to be done in a way that they were like comparable enough. So that, so even though cram, you're not supposed to, you know, look at a cram score and what one let one wetland type to the other, you're doing it basically like relative within that wetland type where it stands. So you so I can see how you could do that with open water or rocky subtitle rocky reef or surf grass or something like that. But each of those habitats would have to have some kind of of assessment method that then you could look at relative within that. And they'd have to be similar enough that relative in this index for this system would be like the same as relative for this other index in another system. Is that, do you think that's right? Yeah, like as a medium, medium quality salt marsh and a, and a medium quality riverine, are they really com comparable? Or are they, is, is that difference or is there a really a big difference? Um, yeah. Yeah, and I don't, I don't have a good answer for that. Um, so. Yeah, so, so I, I was I was hoping when we were thinking of this originally that we would have like the the grand unification theory, right? the grand unification equation that would just work 
everywhere. Um, uh, I don't know if that's possible. Right now, based on our conversations today, I, I, I feel like I'm, we're, we're leaning, or at least first pass, I'm leaning more towards um, kind of like what Rich was mentioning at one point earlier, which is maybe it's it's too big a lift to sort of have a grand unification framework. Maybe instead we have situation A, situation B, situation C, and we have different uh, guidance or different equivalency um, suggestions for those things. So for example, we keep referencing habitat, right? Spatial extent of a, of a community that's damaged. And, and it might, it, I think it's easier to do that in the context of um, how many acres of wetland were damaged or, or, or what quality of wetland was damaged, et cetera, to some other uh, habitat versus if we're talking about something such as services, which might not have a, a particular spatial component or what have you. Um, um, so maybe, maybe we have sort of a, a, a um, uh, like a, a can, you know, like, like a choose your own adventure in the sense of like, hey, so what's this first prime uh, uh, charging question? And then and then that kicks us into some uh, way of measuring equivalency. Um, uh, that, that's one thought from from our conversations. We, we, we seem to be very, we, there's some, some things seem to be sticky and we, we seem to be um, uh, uh, thinking about things in a similar way oftentimes. Um, uh, that, yeah, that's I my think... initial thought. I don't. I didn't. Never thought we'd get to a point where there'd be one ring to unify them all or rule them all. Um, but, <laughs> um, but I, yeah, I figured what we could do is is come up with just a very structured, logical approach to to dealing with these various situations. Because I can tell you, it's like having been in the regulatory um, arena for a very long time. It's like there are different levels of regulators it's like we've got people that are seasoned been doing it for decades really get out to sites a lot have a good um feel and sense of what they're doing and then there are people that we just hired <laughs> who don't really know any of that um and then they're just people that just never really develop and and just really don't have the interest and if we could at least provide a basic framework or understanding to people of how you approach different situations so that they they know the right questions to ask or if they're looking at the right mm -hmm. set of factors um mm -hmm. i mean right is of course a judgment call but, I, I get you i get you. but but yeah. yeah i mean we've got a lot of smart people involved in this and have been doing this type of work for a very long time i think there's it's like this is sort of the group not that we're a star chamber here but this is the sort of group that you would want to try to figure out, well, how do you start cracking the nut? Uh, it's like, what are the things that are worth considering and approaching these things in just a very logical way? Aren't we talking here about a justification system that really is based on ecological relationships? And maybe there's a series of questions that need to be asked about the nature of the relationship between the compensation that's being offered, the out of kind compensation, and how that relates ecologically to the um, to you know the part of the ecological system that's being impacted, and and maybe it's on the basis of those relationships that that you're building a justification for the validity of the compensation that's being offered. Hmm. So it would be like a, a, a idiosyncratic, it's not the right term, but it would be a, it would be a, um, well, I'm just thinking about, I'm just thinking, you know, if you're talking about a riverine system versus uh, a marsh or whatever, there is a connectivity uh, of those two, right? Or for that matter, anything in a contributory watershed to a coastal wetland is an ecological relationship that could become one component of, of, of a justification 
for, you know, and, and I'm suggesting that there might be, as you break it down by your different, um, you know, the ecosystem services, the, uh, the structure, the function, and the ecosystem services, there might be a series of questions that that gets asked to that helps to define the ecological relationship between the impact and the mitigation. Mm -hmm. And some of it could be quantified and some of it might be, you know, more on a qualitative level. Right. And I think I think I think you're speaking to the the worry that we get too far out of kind, right? Or 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 too right. Uh, too lacking yeah, too of a far nexus. Afield. Of, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I I yeah, don't know. So, so it's it's, just... No, that's good. That's good. I mean, I think I think equally like equally important to the what does the framework look like is um is is and we did want to discuss this. Obviously, we're getting running out of time, of course, but but um, you know, did want to discuss, uh, and maybe because these are things that we might be coming up with on our own, maybe we'll start a new a new document that people can just put in thoughts or questions or whatever um, as you guys are working on stuff next week or Friday or two weeks from now, um, so we can just have those sort of key questions or, or musings in one place. But just I think just as important as this, what is the framework or what is the equation or what is the the specific relationships? Uh, is the whole idea of what is the bridge too far you know what, what what are the red lines what are the red flags that we want to want to make sure that uh, even though you know theoretically we can say thing is equal to thing is is there a is are there um guideposts that we want to make sure we don't go past so that this cannot be used in in this far removed a context or something like that so th that's important as well uh, absolutely. And I just want to jump in on that. It's not, I don't have a quantifiable um, guidepost here, but scarcity can be a factor that you consider when is it appropriate to go out of kind. Uh, what Spencer was describing about considering lower condition or lower quality in trading up out of kind resonated with me, but I've always thought about it like if you're you can't just apply that condition criteria you have to think about the scarcity of what you're looking at too um hopefully that makes sense yeah totally and i think i think one of the things that 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 we've been thinking about are are i think that totally makes sense in terms of our our traditional well, traditional not the other word a current current way of thinking about stuff but i i do worry a lot about things like um uh, sea level rise loss of our beaches where it just might not be possible to save some of these beaches, right? So if we go 20, 30 years in the future, um, some of these pocket beaches, you know, in, in, a, in a cliff type setting, like there might not be a, a, an opportunity for inland migration, at least for that that local area or that watershed or that sand shed or whatever. And so in, the, in that context, um, it might not even be scarcity, it might be elimination of the of the activity of the of the species of the of the habitat and and um and and just and to still provide some kind of guidance even if we even if the thing might be locally extinct if, as it were um can we still derive some of the benefits that 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 feature was having on on the local area even though it might be in the form of something else but um but yeah no but but scarcity is good. I've, I've, I've jotted that down. Other other key things you guys are wondering about just from our initial thoughts here that I want to make sure I capture or, or we hear from you um, on. Yeah, and scarcity is is important. And we certainly think of that that type of context. Like we, we have had these discussions before about doing salt marsh restoration because salt marsh has really taken it in the shorts. I mean, way over 90% loss relative to historic context. And so... Um, I know Brian's on the phone from NIMS and we've had these discussions about like open water versus salt marsh. And one of the considerations was that because salt marsh has been so depleted um, that it it was good as a, as a restoration option, even though it's not perfect, you can't equate open water with salt marsh, obviously. Um, it's 
it is a factor that we would consider. And ultimately, we're going to be making a value judgment. But what we hope is that it's as informed as possible. And so clearly, how that la the landscape is going to change over time needs to be considered, I think, in that. And so these different factors that we're talking about, I mean, we're just looking kind of at functions or overall health or whatever. Um, but we're going to need to use that. And these other factors are going to certainly inform that and they need to inform that. Yeah, I do think going to your earlier point, Sean, at the end of the day, a likely way I see this playing out is you're going to have sort of multiple, like you, the compensation burden, there's going to be multiple sort of um, obligations that need to be fulfilled, right? So you may need yeah. to compensate for function or area, and then you may need to compensate for service. Those may be two totally different forms of compensation. And, you know, yeah whoever is doing the impact is going to have to meet both those forms of compensation. Right. Um, totally. So. And yeah. if it costs them more, you know, going to the right, if it costs them more, so be it. Right. Because we have a limited number of coastal resources. Right. So. Yep. Awesome. And, and Sean, else? my one word summary for the point you brought up, I would call it durability. You got to consider the durability of both the impact site and your mitigation site. Good. And, and then one other thing we end up keeping your notes, and this you've heard me say this before, so it's uh, I'll sort of beat my drum on this, is I think that we really need to do a much um, more thorough job in, in documenting the beneficiary communities of these resources, right? Which I think we've utterly failed at in the past, right? So. Or didn't even try in the past. <laughs> or even tried. We even, I mean, yeah, we haven't even tried, right? So. Yeah. Aren't there um, practical regulatory you know, existing frameworks that really bear on how far afield you can get on out of kind. I mean, I'm just thinking about, for instance, Coastal Commission. I don't, I don't think they are actually able to accept mitigation for an impact inside the coastal zone that where the mitigation is outside of the coastal zone. I think they, they have a statutory limitation with regard to that. Is that something that should be taken into account here? I don't, I, that's a good point. Uh, I'm gonna put that, I'm gonna write that down in a second. That's, that's a good point, but I don't, I don't think so initially because you, it's true that, that they have a, or the uh, BCDC ha, has a, you know, uh, uh, very clear geographic uh, uh, area of operations. But you know, cow fish and wildlife, um, it could be up in the up in the watershed or what have you. So I don't I don't know if it if inherently by definition we have to be limited, um, and and we've used the the generic definition of coastal zone as as broadly writ. And we've we've not delineated it as as um, the coast by the coastal act definition or some other linear distance or some such thing. Um, so so it's it's. It's important to think about, but I don't know if we should overly per constrain ourselves, uh, given that we're, we're supposed to be providing help to the state as a whole. And and I could think, yeah. I mean, it still may be a policy impediment of sorts, um, but I could theoretically envision scenarios where a mitigation activity outside the coastal zone is indirectly oh benefiting the resource in the coastal zone. So for example, yeah. um, eelgrass in Morro Bay, the, the watershed suffers from sedimentation problems. So if you take actions up in the watershed, theoretically, you're going to have an indirect benefit downstream. If it's a known stressor, you could come up with some sort of connection there that, that could work. Right. And yeah, similarly, or, or if you, I'm, I'm sorry, certainly if you go to the the coastal access, right? Part of the coastal act talks about, you know, coastal access, which I think opens up a broader, uh, you can have a broader perspective in that sense, right? Yeah, or, or I just was gonna add like, uh, so maybe uh, floating sea pen aquaculture in federal waters that might lead to some recruitment in, in state waters, inshore waters. So yeah, I, yeah totally good, good points. Other, uh, our time's getting near the end. I want to make sure anybody that had a chance to to pipe up yet has, uh, 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 if they wanted to voice any comments or thoughts or inspirations.
Okay, cool. Well, this this uh, this Google Sheet spreadsheet uh, guy we're staring at uh, will be open. Please do add to it as you guys have ideas. We'll also start another uh, in that same folder. Uh, um, a um, uh, um, uh, a good, just a Google Doc that people can put more just sort of qualitative comments and, and suggestions and everything. And these will remain open, you know, for the next many weeks or month or two or whatever we're doing here. Um, and as you guys do have have thoughts, please do capture those in there so that we can all sort of see what what each other is thinking about. Um, uh, I want to ask uh, our our newest folks that have joined us um, to maybe hang back for a, if they have time for, uh, you know, five minutes or so after we wrap just so we can make sure we, we get everybody on boarded. But just to make sure everybody should have a, or at least after today, everybody should have access to our shared Google drives and in there are our uh, previous documents and, and all that kind of good stuff. It's also where your subgroups um, are adding materials and, 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 and have your um, working documents. Um, also just want to remind folks that uh, in talking with uh, uh, folks, if, and we've mentioned this to all of our undergraduate assistants, uh, but if you, know, you are in, let's say, ecosystem services group, you find a great reference, um, but it speaks to function or something that's not, um, uh, uh, you know, you know not, not, not for your specific group, please do again, flag that, grab that study, you know, nail that thing and, and, um, and share that with, with our wider group so that we can make sure we, we capture that. Um, and, uh, as we go forward. And then the, the next thing to say is that again, we, we've, we've blocked out the September 27th date as our, as our face to face date. And so for folks, um, that haven't joined us yet, um, that's going to be an all day meeting that so that's that's like a you know face to face in oxnard california we have money to to bring folks here if you're if you're far away and hotels and all that kind of good stuff um for that 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 date and maybe we, we push it but just for um clarity we would have everybody that's coming from afar come on the 20 the day before travel the day before so that stay in the hotel that night so that we can get get going in the morning and then have a an all day um, working group just one day this time not not a multi day meeting but one day. Um, and so I think I think Rich and Brenton and I need to talk about more um, about that but but for right now that if, if you haven't just put that in your calendar the September 27th needing to travel on the 26th if, if, if you are far away, please, please pencil that in, but we may need to push that back uh, a week or a couple weeks or something, depending on how much time we, we feel we, um, we need. Uh, and, uh, and so, so yeah. And so with that, I will, um, we will, we'll be reaching out and um, uh, checking in on everybody. Uh, keep cranking. Um, we currently have uh, next week, a, a week from today, just to see your drafts, right? So again, that as long as you guys are working in that one unified document um, that we initially started, even if you have other documents that you're using as a sandbox or whatever, if you could at least update that uh, main document by next Monday, that would be great. And that would give Rich and Brenton and I a chance to start to sort of look through that and see if we can provide some more guidance. Rich and Brent and I will also get together and, and, and maybe make a, a first stab at a potential framework or a few series of frameworks and share that with everybody so that um, uh, that that might also inform you. As Pete was saying, maybe if we do go through for dollars or a monetization or something that might influence how you think about some of the candidate met metrics. Um, and oh, and so Michelle just said that 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 the existing date we picked, which is 927 is maybe bad for for uh logistical reasons for some folks um so that's so that's great so so we might do a a doodle poll to to figure out an alternative um a time frame um and so it sounds like the 27th is is problematic for several folks so good to know so thank you for that so um uh just out of curiosity two weeks later mid-october qualitatively before people uh disappear is is mid-october a bit better for folks generally speaking um, and we can do we'll, we'll do a doodle poll just to, yeah. to check i know the week of the 16th i'm out of i'm in another meeting that week but the week before that for me looks good yeah it might be in georgia then okay to double right, so so it sounds like we will need to do it uh, perhaps
Sorry, go ahead, sorry. Michelle. I think the FY just, just deals with the, the agency. So if there's not a lot of agency folks on the on the group that need to travel, then it's not a it's not an issue. So we have a lot of we have a lot of agency folks. <laughs> okay. So, so good to know. Good, good. Our fiscal All right, people cool. do not uh, like to get uh, travel orders and money like over FYs. So just FYI, they don't like that. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. Um, okay, great. So, so we'll we'll do a doodle poll to figure out when that face to face thing is. Um, but uh, super appreciate this. And again, uh, we're going to try to do more um, more dropping in uh, if we're not formally part of your subgroups over the next few weeks to help uh, help things along. Um, and uh, and yeah, Rich, is there anything else you wanted to to add before we get to wrap up time? No, nothing else to add. Thanks, everyone. Okay. Yeah, so I just want to say, so we all want to say thanks for all the work everybody's putting in. Tons of work, really, really appreciate it. Um, we know that this is, uh, uh, it's you know, crafting new things, brainstorming is it can can take time, um, but we really appreciate all the effort. And I think uh, we're 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 on the cusp of starting to pull some really cool things together, and we super appreciate it. Um, so keep checking in with your groups. Again, if you're some of our new folks that have joined us and and aren't formally into a, a group or two, if you wouldn't mind hanging back for five minutes so we could uh, so Rich and I can can chat with you, um, that's great. Other than that, unless people have a a, a big question, I will uh, kill the uh, kill the recording. So Sean. And, uh,